Hi, everyone. Um, so, yes, uh, as Ashley said, uh, my name is Paul Jeffries, um, and this is part of an ongoing series of lectures that the institution is putting on about computational design, um, focusing on various different aspects of it. And the aspect I want to talk about uh, in particular tonight is scaling up computational design. And by that, I mean working on bigger scales of projects, but also scaling it up in the sense of using a lot of wider range of different projects and using it for a wider range of different things. Um, so uh, Ashley already gave me a wonderful introduction, um, but this is, this is kind of a potted CV. Um, I've been in the industry about 12 years now. I started out at Arup uh, working in the advanced geometry unit. Uh, where I worked alongside Tristan Simmons, who gave the last lecture in this uh, series. Was it the last one or the one, one before? Okay. Um, I then moved to Arab Associates, which is kind of Arab's architectural bit, or at least it was. Um, and then two and a bit years ago, uh, I got recruited by Ramble to move over there and uh, head up uh, their computational design team, uh, which was actually originally founded by Stephen Melvo, who gave... Uh, another talk in this lecture series a uh, couple of times ago. Yeah, some, some time ago. So, as you can see, the world of computational design is a little bit small at the moment, so we need to try and make that a bit bigger. Uh, and then, yes, uh, outside of working hours, I also uh, lecture at a couple of different universities, uh, the Bartlett Imperial College London um, and the Architectural Association Design Research Laboratory. Uh, so, I am a computational designer, uh, my full job title is actually Computational Design Lead and Chief Digital Zoologist. That's what it says on my, um, says on my contract. But uh, essentially, I'm a computational designer. And different people use that term um, and mean potentially different things by it. Uh, but in my case, what that means is that I'm a structural engineer and I'm a coder and I'm a software developer. Um, and I used to say I'm 50% structural engineer, 50% uh, software developer, but I think that's slightly short-selling it. So the, the bit of it that I'm interested in is actually the synergy between those two disciplines. Um, and that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so that's enough about me. Let's talk about you guys for a little bit. Uh, I just want to gauge the audience before I go on. So uh, for a quick show of hands, um, who here in this room would consider themselves to be a proficient computational designer? Okay, so three or four. Um, okay, that's, yeah, that's not, not too surprising. Um, okay, next row of hands, who here can use Excel? Okay, pretty much everybody. So how do you use Excel? Uh, well, when you use Excel, you type some numbers into a box, you type other numbers into other boxes, and then sometimes what you do is you put a little equal sign and then after that, you put an equation which describes the result of an operation on several of those inputs. And that essentially is what computational design is. Um, it's about defining inputs, defining a process that operates on those inputs, and that gives you the output that you want. And you can then play around with those inputs, play around with that process um, in order to better that result, give you a better result. Um, so Excel isn't normally thought of as a computational design tool, but if you can use Excel and you, know, you, you use it in design, then congratulations, you are a computational designer. Uh, come see me afterwards. I'll teach you the secret handshake you have. Um, so Excel is essentially a computational design tool. It's not really thought of as such, but the more canonical computational design tools you might have heard of, such as Grasshopper, they work in a very, very similar way. Um, you define a set of inputs, you define a process that operates on those inputs, and you get something out the other end. Um, the slight difference is, so Grasshopper is actually easier to use, if anything, because it's graphical. All you need to do is define a process graphically. You essentially draw out the process diagram. Um, so it's, you don't even need to type. Uh, it's very, very much easier. Um, and Grasshopper is also geared a bit more towards the geometry side of things rather than Excel, which is more geared towards numbers. 
But if you can use Excel, then there's absolutely nothing stopping you from going on and learning how to use Grasshopper. So over the past decade or so, I must have taught at least 600 people or so Grasshopper, and some people found it easier than others, and some people find it a little bit harder, but in all that time, I've never come across anybody that couldn't at least get to grips with the basics of it. So um, there's quite a lot to computational design. I don't want to short sell it, um, but uh, this is essentially, it's not the, the secrets of the universe here. These are all tools that have been designed by human beings to be easy to use by other human beings. Um, so going back to Excel for a moment, uh, those of you in this room who use Excel, hopefully use it in the way I've described by, by you know, putting in equations and using the functionality of Excel. But have you ever sat down with someone and looked over their shoulder and found that they are not using Excel in this way? Instead, they're sitting there, maybe with a calculator in their hand, and they're just typing in each cell individually, cell by cell, row by row, row by row. Or alternately, have you ever got a spreadsheet that someone else has made, and you go to click on a cell to find out what the equation is, and you find it's just a number, or you change a number in a box, and you expect to see um, something happen, and, and it just stays the same, because there isn't that embedded logic in it. Um, I can see a few people nodding along. So if you've experienced that, isn't that really annoying? Isn't that you know a colossal waste of potential? Uh, don't you just want to murder that person? <laughs> and isn't that output much less valuable than it could be if it's just a simple static thing? Um, now, obviously, in this room, we're all intelligent engineers. We all use Excel uh, properly. But imagine that in this industry, everybody was, was doing that. Everybody was just treating Excel as something that you just type numbers into. It didn't have any functionality beyond that. Think about all the wasted hours that would entail. Think about all of the mistakes that would be easily made and that would be then very difficult to catch. Wouldn't that be annoying? Wouldn't that seem like a, a bit of a waste of time? Wouldn't you want to turn up to some prestigious institution and subtly harangue your peers and colleagues that maybe there was a better way of doing things? Um, so we don't live in that world, fortunately. I would say that... Uh, the use of Excel within this industry is, is pretty mature, but to be a little bit controversial perhaps, I would say that Excel is maybe the exception rather than the rule. There are lots of ways in which we use computers as part of the design and construction process, which are maybe not as mature as they could be, um, and maybe there's, there's better ways that we could approach using these things. Um, so we have, of course, digitized a lot in this industry. We've moved on to using computers. But a lot of the time, what that meant was that we digitized the same process that we were using before without really changing that process. So back in the olden days, we had a drawing board and a pencil, and we would draw out a line with a pencil like that. Whereas nowadays, we have a CAD package, and we have a screen in front of us, and we have a mouse, and we draw out a line like that. It's not that much of a, of a change. It's still essentially treating computers as if they were the pens and pencils and paper and cardboard and sticky back plastic that we used to have in order to explore our designs and express our designs. So. We have digitized in certain ways. You know, it's still nice to be able to do that. We can still copy paste and save different versions and things like that. And we've used computers to help us with the physical side of design, a lot of that modeling and things like that. We don't necessarily do physically so much anymore. We do it in the computer instead. But what computational design is all about is pushing that a little bit harder and pushing what we can do with computers to help us out further and push it into helping us out with the mental side of design as well. Because computers aren't just static media like paper and cardboard and these things that we had before. They are themselves thinking machines. They can compute. Um, and by doing that and by using computers in this way in order to compute, um, we can get them to actually help us out 
in resolving some of the logic of our designs and to help us improve the logic of our designs. Now, to illustrate a little bit what I mean by this, I'm going to start by talking about one of my favorite computational designers, um, this guy here, Mr. Anthony Gaudi. Um, and he's a very accomplished computational designer, especially considering he died 20 years before the computer was invented. So Gaudi didn't have computers. He didn't have code. He didn't have parametric models and grasshopper and things like that. Uh, what he had instead was lengths of chain and little bags of sand and models that he could construct out of these. So what Gaudi was doing here is essentially constructing a very early form of parametric model. What he was doing here was constructing a model upside down where because it was built of chains and because chains have no bending resistance, in order to resist the forces of gravity that he was applying to it, they would have to adopt a form that could resist the forces of gravity purely in tension. And if you take those and turn it upside down, you end up with a form which resists the forces of gravity purely in compression and is therefore very efficient under that particular load case. Um, so this is essentially a parametric model uh, that describes inputs and a process which creates a result. So the inputs here are the positions of support of those chains, the lengths of the chains, the positions of the weights on those. And these were all things that Gaudi could manipulate and play around with in order to end up with the geometry that he wanted. But the process going on behind that ensured that that process was producing an output which was going to be structurally efficient. So what I'm talking about here doesn't even necessarily need computers. I, mean, I know that's a bit of a weird thing to say that computational design doesn't need computers. Um, but what we do have, well, the advantage we do have over Gaudi is that we're not just restricted to the processes that we use being whatever physical phenomena we can happen to have lying around um, in order to uh, you know, build up our model. We can essentially simulate or model any process that we want in order to help us to create a design that we know is going to have properties that we want. And this is useful for a number of reasons. Uh, one of which, one of the main ones, is that it helps us to deal with the complexity of design. So in Gaudi's case, it meant he didn't have to draw out lots and lots of stacked catenary arches, all of which were subtly different because they were influenced by the ones um, above or below them. <coughs> Instead, he could just let the physical process compute that for him. Um, and computers are, are useful for dealing with complexity because the way that computers understand complexity is a little bit different to the way that human beings understand complexity. So if I was to say to you as a human being, start from that shape there and then give me the one on the right-hand side, you might struggle to do that. So this is, this is a fractal image, or fractalesque image, I should say. Uh, it's generated by recursively mirroring and scaling um, this face shape uh, till you get something like that. And that's something that it's quite complicated for a human being to get their head around and jump straight from there to there. But for a computer, this is a relatively straightforward thing to do. This, this, the code that I wrote to do this was about five or six lines long. I can't remember exactly, but it wasn't a particularly complicated bit of code in order to do this. So some things which are very, very complicated for humans are very, very simple for computers and vice versa. So when we're talking about dealing with complexity, um, ordinarily when we're talking about computational design, very often we are talking about geometric complexity, complex geometry, uh, advanced geometry if you want to uh, use the terminology uh, of the AGU. Um, and yes, I have worked in my time on quite a few different uh, complex geometry projects. Um, and under ordinary circumstances, I might well wax lyrical about these for, for the rest of the lecture. But I think there's a slight problem with doing that, which is that these tend to be the projects that always get talked about in the context of computational design, and I think that creates a bit of a false impression that they're the only things that computational design is good for. Um, in fact, complex geometry projects like this 
are to an extent the easiest thing to use computational design for, just because it's easier to find an excuse to use computational design and invest the time um, in developing uh, the tools and, and the workflows and, and the projects you need for that. Um, because these kind of projects couldn't really be realized by any other means. Um, but, and I want to stress this, that doesn't mean that for the other 99% of projects, which aren't all weird and wobbly and wonderful shapes, um, computational design is not applicable. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some complex geometry projects because that is, that is where I started out. This is how I kind of learned to do this stuff. But uh, I'm only going to talk about a few, and then I'm going to move on to other types of projects. Um, and what I'm going to focus on on these projects is going to be the most scalable aspects of them. Um, so one project I'll talk about that I worked on quite a while ago is this, the ArcelorMittal orbit for the London 2012 Olympic Games. Um, and there are many ways that this has been described by various people. But I would think that quite a lot of people would agree that this is complex geometry. Um, although, from a certain point of view, from a computer's point of view, in fact, uh, that is not really the case. This is actually a fairly straightforward geometry um, if you choose to define it in a straightforward way. Um, and what we did for this project was to essentially define all of that geometry um, being based on a single centerline curve, which was then, through various rules and various other little parameters around dimensions and things like that, translated into, uh, through Grasshopper, through Parametric Design Tool, into the full 3D geometry of the overall building. Um, and once we had that geometric model, uh, that then went through uh, a tool that I developed called Salamander, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, and that then went into our analysis package. Um, and also into our, well, I don't think we called it BIM back then, but in, into essentially our BIM package, which was Tetla, just to give Trimble their money's worth, um, which was then issued to the contractor in order to build it. But what this let us do is essentially simplify the complexity of this geometry into just uh, a very simple set of inputs that we could then sit down with the artist and push and pull and play around with and tweak until he had something that he was happy with, until it, we had something that we as structural engineers were sure could stand up, because we could just spit it through this process, produce an analysis model, and then check that it was working OK, and then feed that back into that loop. Um, so that was essentially how that, how that project developed. Um, and I said I'd mention uh, this tool uh, here called Salamander. Uh, or to give it its full name, Structural Analysis Link and Manager for Data Entry and Retrieval. Uh, you might be able to see what I did there. Um, so this uh, was a tool that I developed in order to essentially solve one of the issues of applying computational design to uh, structural problems, uh, which is that out of the box, uh, a lot of computational design tools like Grasshopper um, only really deal with essentially dumb geometry. They don't really, they deal with surfaces and curves and abstract geometry types like this. Uh, they don't deal with um, kind of beams and columns and section sizes and structural loads and things like that. Um, so uh, Salamander was a kind of bespoke bit of software that plugged into um, Rhino, which is a CAD package some of you might be familiar with. Um, and extended that to be able to uh, deal with that kind of data. So to be able to deal with loads and materials and section sizes and so on. Um, and that meant that then we could use that 3D modeling environment, that very powerful 3D modeling environment, to produce and export our analysis models. We didn't have to remodel everything um, in uh, our analysis package. Um, and this was something that I originally developed for fairly selfish reasons. Um, but it's something that turned out to be quite scalable because I put a bit of thought into how I wanted to scale that. Um, so when I was developing that, I thought about how I might want to use it in future. I thought about how other people might want to use it. And I put a bit of effort into actually turning this into a product or at least a, a project that, that I could use again and again and that other people 
uh, in the company could use again and again. Um, so uh, this actually turned into something that by the time I left Arup, there were around 400 people throughout the company using this on a, quite a regular basis in order to help um, with setting up their models. Um, so this is something that I used again and again and again. Um, and that was essentially made possible by having a little bit of thought about it at the beginning and thinking about how to set that up in a way that it could be reused. Um, and fortunately, I was a grad back then. I was quite cheap, so I could kind of get away with spending time doing that. Um, but yeah, so this, this is essentially the last project I worked on before I left Arup, and that was essentially using the same workflow uh, that I developed earlier on. Um, so this was the new Doha Tennis Stadium, uh, which will hopefully get built one of these days. Um, but this is a <laughs> uh, large 20,000-seater uh, tennis stadium with a uh, movable roof on top. Um, and we were using a computational design workflow in this case, again, to explore the geometry of this. Um, so we came up with the idea of the roof geometry um, essentially being a reciprocal um, star arrangement. Um, and by parametrically modeling that, we could then play around with that geometry in order to give us the right size of opening that we wanted um, at the center of that, of that geometry, but also to give us uh, parallel lines uh, which could then form the tracks of the moving roof at a suitable um, distance apart. So, um, again, that was using it to kind of deal with geometric complexity and help us to resolve that and come up with something that would work. Um, and the other useful part of this uh, was that we could, by that point, I developed Salamander enough that we could essentially define everything that we needed to define uh, in that one package. So out of that one computational model, out of that was being spat a full analysis model and a full BIM model, um, <coughs> which was quite useful. Um, and the other useful aspect of it, as well as dealing with the geometric complexity, is dealing with the complexity of how all these different parts of the structure interacted with one another. Um, so in this case, uh, the movable roof uh, up the top here. The structural model for that was having its reaction forces automatically extracted from it and then applied to the main roof along those tracks in a variety of different um, locations that, that we needed to check in order to make sure that as that moving roof moved backwards and forwards, that would uh, not have adverse effects on the fixed roof. Um, and this ended up being, being quite a, a complex workflow in some regards, so each box on here uh, is essentially a different file for a different part of the building in a different package. Um, but actually, everything within this dotted line was all being controlled from the one place, from within Rhino. Um, so from a workflow point of view, this actually made it quite easy to manage that whole geometry. Um, and for part of that project, I was essentially designing and modeling and, and producing everything for uh, the steel part of that structure. There are a couple of other guys working on the concrete bits, I should point out, um, essentially by myself, which I don't recommend, but uh, it is possible to do that with these kind of techniques. Um, <coughs> now, when I left Arup, I had to leave all that code behind, which was a bit of a shame, because that, by that point, I was a little bit useless without it. Um, so after I left Arup, I then started essentially redeveloping uh, that toolkit from scratch, um, and this new version of the tool is a little bit different to the old one, but it essentially does the same thing. It acts as uh, an interpreter that sits inside Rhino and inside Grasshopper um, and then allows communication between that and a variety of different analysis packages of various kinds. Um, and there were a couple of nice things about rewriting that. First of all, it meant that because I did it in my spare time, I could release it for free. So uh, that is available as freeware, so if you want to uh, start using uh, Rhino and Grasshopper in this way, uh, then that is something that you can use to do that. Uh, there are other packages of a similar nature available, I should say. Um, and it's also uh, open source, so if anybody feels like adding something to that or, uh, or you know, plugging in a, a, a link to another software package, then come and, come and see me. Um, the other nice thing about uh, rewriting that from scratch is that by this point I had a fairly good idea about the things that 
I needed to keep writing again and again and again on different software projects. Um, so as I was writing this, what I essentially did was to take all the parts of that which were fairly generic and that could be reused, and I split that out into a separate um, software library called dot nucleus or dot net unifying class library for engineering utility software. Um, and this is again also open source, so you can get a hold of this if you want to and play around with it. Um, but what this was very useful for is that it meant that the basic code um, that I used to write that new version of Salamander could then be reused again and again and again and again and again for other projects. And a lot of the projects I'm going to talk about now actually use this same code base and build on top of it and grow out from there. Um, so after that project, I move over to Ramble. Um, and one of the first projects I got involved there uh, was this one, Clapham Park. Now, this doesn't have a lot of geometric complexity. It's fairly, fairly standard um, residential building developments. But what this had was complexity of another kind, and that complexity was to do with the scale of this project. Um, so this is quite a large housing development in South London. Um, aim is to build 2,500 new homes over the next 10 years across 15 different sites. Um, and I can't remember how many separate buildings there are, but there's 52 different cores in that. Um, so I think this is actually the largest detailed planning application that's ever been put in, in the UK. Um, and the complexity here came from the scale, but also from the limited time frame that we had to actually work this through and to, to deliver it. Um, so we only had basically six months to go through um, this part of the design process. Um, and what we did was to sit down at the start and look through, uh, okay, this is all the things we need to do in order to deliver this project from a structural point of view. And we worked out how long each of that might normally take. Um, and what we worked out is that with a team of four people, to run through all of that would take about four months. Um, so we could do it in the time that we had available, but we could only really do it once. And we'd have to freeze that geometry really early on um, in the design process, um, which was not going to make a lot of people very happy. Um, so what we started to do here was to look at how we could use computational design um, in order to speed up um, that process. And in order to do that, we developed a few bits of custom software, um, which would speed up various parts of that process. Um, and we started out by prototyping these things um, in Grasshopper. I keep talking about Grasshopper, but here it is again. Um, to create prototypes, just to test out the processes that we wanted to do, because we could you know, run, run through that and put something together in, in a couple of days. Um, but then to make sure that this could be used by the wider um, design team and also by everybody else in Ramble further down the line. Um, we redeveloped these as standalone tools with um, specialized interfaces to make using them very, very easy and straightforward. Um, and then to help, help the project lead with reviewing all this, we, we hooked these things up to an online dashboard. Um, so uh, I'm sure if you're a structural engineer in this room, you don't need me to explain what a load takedown process is, but uh, I'm sure you'd agree it can be a bit of a pain in the bum. Uh, even when you're using you know, Excel and spreadsheets and things like that, there's still a lot of manual work going on here to calculate tributary areas and then tally everything up and make sure you've got the right um, you know, connectivity and things like that. Um, so what we did was to develop a tool called Tadpole. You might notice a uh, slight theme in the way we name stuff. Um, or take down process on loaded elements. I only have one skill, and that's naming things after animals, so I'm going to keep coming back to that. Um, and what this essentially was is a very, very quick and easy way of graphically putting together um, load takedowns. So you essentially just import the drawings, you mark up where the column positions are, it works out uh, most of the rest of it for you. You still need to, uh, you did, you need to know what you're doing, you need to you know, make sure that continuity and things like that are being respected okay, but it speeds up the process a lot. Um, the other thing that we needed to do uh, was design the cores. Um, and to do that, we took uh, essentially a kit of parts approach. Um, so we had 52 different cores throughout this building. 
Um, and to keep things sensible, we, we wanted to basically figure out where we could reuse cores as much as possible. Um, so a colleague of mine um, developed in parallel uh, a bit of software called Cobra, or Core Options Boundary Range Analysis. Um, and that was a similar sort of tool, but for doing core design. Um, and what we automated out of this process uh, was essentially for each core design, um, we could plot out the range of different building heights and dimensions that that core was going to be suitable for. So, you know, we work out what the lateral loads on that would be, and then we could say, okay, this particular core, we look at that graph, this can serve that building and that building and that building and that building and so on. Um, and then finally, we'd spat all the information out of that into a Power BI dashboard that um, people could uh, interrogate and look at if they were particularly interested. Um, and what all that did for us was it meant that we could run through that whole design process 12 times faster than we could before. So rather than just having one design iteration throughout that six months, we could instead have 12 we could be much more responsive to changes that the architect and the client was requesting. So we still took that full six months. We didn't just you know, do it in one twelfth of the time, but what it meant is that we could iterate more, we could deliver a better product. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we, we now do a lot. Whenever a project comes in, we're always looking for the opportunities in that to pull out things and do tools that that can uh, automate parts of that process. Um, so we've got tools now to uh, optimize the panel arrangement on freeform roofs, um, to panelize building floor plates into prefabricated modules, um, to build up um, prefab offsite um, buildings based on those modules and, and kind of let the uh, user select those and, and build them up block by block, that kind of uh, virtual Lego. Um, and some of my colleagues in Southampton, uh, in the transport side, have essentially fully automated the process of designing motorway gantries. So it does, does pretty much everything you could possibly want, uh, including work out what signs you can put on it and things like that. Um, I've also done other stuff, looking at, say, car park optimization um, and uh, many, 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 many more. Um, so we now have a huge range of different computational design tools um, that have been designed to be reusable um, and that help us to speed up our process of design and delivery. Um, but speeding up that process doesn't just help us to you know, do our jobs faster. It also opens up new opportunities as well. Um, so one of the opportunities that we've been looking at quite a lot is around better communication with our clients. Um, so for example, this is an interactive dashboard that we've now deployed on a few different projects. And what this allows us to do is to sit down with the client, has a number of different uh, structural options pre-baked into this, which are essentially scored to different uh, criteria. And we can sit down with the client in a meeting and say, OK, so for each of these criteria, give us a number one to five. How important is this criteria actually to you for this project? And we can then sit down and go through that. And we can say, OK, at the end of that, this is the option that we would recommend based on what you've told us. And of course, the, art, the, the aim of this is not just to say, oh, well, the computer says this is the best, and therefore it is. It's to actually engage the client a bit more in conversation about what it is they actually want to get out of this. Because you know, at the end of this process, they might say, oh, well, OK, everything I've told you results in this design. But actually, thinking about it, you know, other stuff. <coughs> what we've also been able to do um, is empower the, design, empower the client uh, to make design decisions themselves. So this is um, a footbridge um, on, a, uh, on a large manufacturing site. I don't think I'm allowed to tell you where it is, uh, who the client was. But essentially, they had a, a busy road junction on their site. They wanted to put a footbridge in to connect two different parts of their site. Um, but they weren't entirely sure where they wanted that to go. 
Um, so we quickly took a few bits of code we had lying around and slapped this together. Um, and essentially, well, we slapped it together also with uh, a bunch of bridge engineers in the background doing lots of calculations. Um, <laughs> so we slapped it together. They did, they did the work. Um, and what we're able to do then is to give this to the client and let them play around with it. So what they could do is simply click and drag to move this bridge around, um, and we could tell them essentially instantly what the implications on that were for the tonnage and thereby the structural cost of that bridge. Um, so before we, they, we came along, they'd been umming and ahhing about where they wanted this bridge to go for a couple of months, um, and after we gave them this, they made their mind up you know, essentially that afternoon. Um, and we've done similar things, but a bit more ambitious, uh, looking at high-rise towers, exploring different options there, feeding back uh, the structural implications of, you know, if I add an extra floor, um, does that actually get me more in that area? Or does that just mean now my core needs to have an extra lift in it, so it suddenly got bigger, and then everything else sizes up? So we can explore that very rapidly, again, sitting in a design meeting. Um, and we have a range of these different generative and analytical techniques now. Um, and what we've been doing over the past year or so is actually starting to take these little chunks of code that do various different things and starting to rewrite them and, and get them working together all in one platform. And what we've then been doing is to put onto that platform a nice, lovely user interface, which we called SiteSolve. Um, which allows generative and interactive exploration of different design options with all of that engineering knowledge and engineering analysis and our own kind of um, our own judgments built into that. And what that lets us do is to bring our engineering analysis much earlier on in the design process. So rather than just you know, the architect and the client making certain decisions early on when we as engineers are not involved and not able to provide feedback, we can actually get involved at an earlier stage. We can help them to head off those decisions which maybe from an engineering point of view are not going to be super beneficial for them. And this lets us be proactive rather than reactive, which is, which is quite nice. Um, so we've used this to work much more closely with architects, for example. So we can run our generators, we can run our analysis, um, and we can give out building arrangements which are particularly beneficial for particular criteria. Um, we give that to the architect, and the architect then says, okay, so I'll actually build in, I'll think about this from an architectural point of view, I won't just take what you give me. Um, and then they can pick out the results which are particularly beneficial and use that as inspiration in their design process. Um, so one of the architects we've been using this with uh, described it as usefully stupid, uh, which I think is one of the nicest compliments I've ever had from an architect. Um, what he means by that is that it doesn't come along with preconceived ideas. It helps him to explore the full range of possibilities on that site and actually have some uh, better information and better feedback on the decisions that he makes. And what we can also do with that is to take architectural geometry and then optimize that for particular criteria. Um, so in this case, uh, this is showing um, a views optimization. But because we have all of these different analytical methods built into this one place, um, we can optimize for certain criteria, but also give information about the trade-offs that are involved in that. So you might push a building up to get better views, but then what implications does that have on the structure and the surrounding overshadowing of the ground plane and things like that. Um, so I won't say any more about that because I don't want to give away all of our best ideas to the competition. But what I do want to do now is, um, is to uh, provide some advice on how to uh, scale up computational design in your own companies um, more generally. Um, because I do think that this is something that uh, the industry is sorely lacking. Um, and something that we've noticed recently is that there are a number of big tech companies who are making moves into construction in various ways. Um, so they're kind of looking at developing their own housing and things like that. Um, and technological disruption is, of course, a good thing. Um, but 
the way I see things going, either we learn to do what these big tech companies do, or they will learn to do what we do. And if there has to be technological disruption, then ideally I would like a lot of the skills and the knowledge and, and you know, the domain knowledge that we as, as engineers and construction professionals have to survive that transition. Otherwise, um, you know, who knows what could happen. So that, that's my ominous warning. Um, but now here's uh, some things you can do about it. Um, so the first thing is to uh, build confidence in what you can do. And as, as I said right at the start of this, uh, nothing I've talked about here should be beyond the reach of anyone that's a professional engineer. It's not, you know, it's not, well, I guess it's, it is as complicated as a rocket scientist, but, you know, we're all engineers, we should be able to deal with rocket science. Um, so, you know, nine-tenths of actually getting to do this is actually just to get over that um, initial fear, that initial apprehension that, oh, this is too complicated, this is only for the young kids or things like that. Um, or, you know, the, the people that have been that have been learning to code since they were eight. Like, I, I personally didn't really start coding until I entered the industry, until after university. So um, it's, it's not, not impossible to, to pick these skills up uh, on the job. Um, the second bit of advice is to start small and build up piece by piece. So this is essentially what we've um, done in Rambo. We started out with um, particular small things and then as we develop more and more of these, we start to see the synergies between them. Um, and in particular, start with things that you want. So start with things that help you, that help the tools that do things that you want. And the reason I say that is that there is an expression in software development that 90% of software development is debugging the specification. And what that means is a, lot of, a large part of actually developing software, developing computational tools and workflows, is actually just working out what it is you want to do in the first place. And if you're building a tool for yourself, then you already have that 90%, you already know. Um, as I said earlier, it's good to, when you're developing these tools, give thought about how you might want to reuse these things in future so that it's not just something that gets abandoned on one particular project. Um, and also, um, yeah, invest a little bit of time in that, I would say. Um, try and find the excuses that you need in order to do that. Um, and yeah, once, once you've done this a few times, you'll start to notice that there are certain things that, that these things have in common, that means they can work together, um, and that where if you start to plug these things in together, you can actually start to uh, develop more kind of multidisciplinary approaches to stuff. Um, the next bit of advice is around building the right set of people. Um, so, in an ideal world, everyone would know how to do computational design. It'd be great. Um, but uh, we don't live in that world, uh, and possibly we don't actually need to. Um, but what you do need to recognize, I think, uh, when thinking about how to scale this up in a company is to make sure you have the right mix of different people. Um, so at the bottom of this pyramid here, um, we've got people who don't necessarily need to be interacting or using computational design itself, but they still need to work with the people who are, who are part of the same design teams. Um, and they need to at least have a basic awareness of, of what's going on there. Um, above that, we have the people who are involved with computational design who are using those tools. Um, and above that, people who are using those tools but also extending those tools. Um, and then up the top, um, people who are capable of actually architecting tools completely from scratch. They're not just modifying it, they're actually building it, building something new. Um, and these aren't necessarily levels of intelligence because um, the people at the bottom, you know, still need to be doing everything else that they need to be doing, but these are levels of specialization. Um, and these different levels of specialization need different kinds of support. Um, so. It's a good idea to try and build a structure a bit like this in terms of how you structure, structure your teams and your overall organization. Because um, if you're missing one of these layers, then um, the whole thing starts to fall apart and it just becomes an insular thing where, where you know, some people are sitting in a corner developing lovely tools for themselves but not necessarily talking to the rest of the business. Um, and finally, uh, an important thing is to develop the right culture around this. I think that's probably the main challenge um, and that's obviously a fairly ephemeral thing, um, but there are a few uh, things that I would 
suggest there, which is specific. Um, the first thing is that in order to develop these tools uh, and or to develop these skills, I should say, um, it does take time. Um, it's not something that happens overnight. It's not something you can necessarily expect people to just do on their own or, or do on their own time. Um, it is an investment that's needed. And when you have lovely, wibbly-wobbly, complex geometry projects, that becomes very easy to justify. When you're looking at more common projects where you, know, you could technically just do it the old way, you've done it for the past 20 years, um, it becomes harder to, to push over that barrier and, and actually start doing that. But it is worth um, investing that time if you think you can get away with it. Um, and again, yeah, the next one is to find those opportunities to actually use it. So uh, like I said before, I've taught a lot of people uh, computational design skills over the years. Um, and some of them find it easy and some of them find it hard. But basically, the people that actually go on to develop those skills further are the people who, having finished whatever course they happen to have done with me, actually then go on to a job where they are able to use these skills and, and put them into practice and, and learn by doing. Because there's a, there's a bit of a step change between knowing the theory of how to do something and then actually learning how to put it into practice and actually um, having that experience growing up. Um, and then the last one is uh, a fairly dull point, but it is actually an increasingly important one, I think, uh, which is to try and make sure that uh, those people who do invest that time, who do develop those skills, this is a bit of a bugbear of mine, incidentally, but um, do actually have uh, the career path uh, laid out in front of them in order to do that. Um, and it's worked out all right for me. I've got a really stupid long job title, but... Um, I talk to a lot of young engineers who would love to get involved with this stuff, but instead they, you know, they have to do the things that they have to do in order to get chartered because that's the way that they progress in their organization. And if they don't do that, then they're going to be stuck at the bottom end forever. Um, and then a lot of people at, at the more senior levels, are, are, we're seeing losing, leaving the industry, going out to work for these tech companies, going to work for startups, going to work for vertically integrated companies like WeWork and things like that. Um, and it's because there's not really um, this kind of career progression available for them a lot of the time. Um, so that's something that, that we as an industry need to, need to do to work on to change, to help to digitalize our process. Um, and the last thing I would say... Uh, which I don't have a slide for, um, is even if you're not going to get involved with this, even if you're not going to be hands-on with this, have a think about the processes that you're using to design. Have a think about whether you're using those because they are the best possible processes and whether they're taking advantage of all of the technology that is now available to us um, and whether there is opportunities there um, to do something better with what is available to you. Um, and even if it's not something you want to get involved with, typing out lines of code, um, it's still something that hopefully you can be aware of and you can take back to your organizations and help to build uh, an industry that is a bit more capable of these kinds of things. Um, so thank you for listening very patiently to my endless waffle. Um, if you have any questions for me, then I will be happy to uh, attempt to answer them. <laughs>